Hello, my name is Chris Snipes, and you are listening to The Melt. Back in the mid-80s, I stumbled across a band called Psychic TV after seeing a video for one of their songs on Night Flight that was unlike anything else that I'd seen at the time. This led me to my local record store where I bought their second album, Dreams Less Sweet, and this was my gateway drug to a whole world of esoteric music that was happening in England at the time that included the likes of Current 93, Death in June, Coil, and Nurse with Wound. These were all bands who seemed to come from the same wellspring as many of their members were interchangeable. They dealt with occult, philosophical, and magical themes that compelled me to want to explore them deeper and which were already interests of mine anyway. A name that kept appearing in the liner notes of many of the albums of these bands was today's guest, Rose McDowell. You can read about her and the other people who populated these bands in an excellent out-of-print book published in 1995 called England's Hidden Reverse. I start off the conversation by asking Rose if she grew up in a musical environment. No, I, I grew up waking up every morning with my dad singing. And my dad had a great record collection. So when people ask me what my musical influences were, it was basically listening to my dad's music collection. <laughs> and so, and he taught me to jive when I was 18 months old. You know, he was so into music and that I would be jiving to his rock and roll stuff. And he liked all the loads of 60s and 50s music and, and even through the 70s. When I, when I turned 12 or 13 maybe, he took me out to buy a record for me to choose a record for myself every weekend. And so my dad was kind of my biggest influence in music. Like he was always singing around the house. He used to sing to my mum to her embarrassment. <laughs> but you know, he was he was just he's just such a nice man and music kinda I just grew up surrounded by music. I was in the choir when I was a child as well. You know, so I can't, I just love singing. And did uh, you, I, from what I gathered, you sort of grew up in a, in a tumultuous environment. Was music sort of a, a catharsis or something to latch onto in, in a chaotic environment like that? Well, music soothes the soul, whether it's happy, sad, whatever, you've got music for every mood. And I think if it wasn't for music, I would have been way more traumatized than I actually was because music in itself can give you solace. And that is reflect my childhood and my upbringing is reflected in my music and in my lyrics. I mean, I tend to write quite melancholy things, but try and do it and I can try and create some beauty out of the horror. Yeah. You know, and but there's also a lot of sadness in there that really, really comes straight from my soul. I mean, the last the last rehearsal I did before before lockdown, last a gig in at the beginning of the year in London, the rehearsal, and then I actually broke down when we went to sing one of my own songs that I've been singing for years. But it just it just got me, you know. It just it just got me at that point and it's like if it can still touch me like that you know it really does come from my soul and so when I'm expressing that to other people I mean I, I think I, I mean most of my gigs there will be people crying in the audience but I did one gig in America and I swear like almost the whole audience cried and it was the most 
I know that sounds like you shouldn't be happy when people cry, but <laughs> it was the most magical feeling, the most powerful feeling that I've ever felt to be able to to touch people so deeply that it brought them to tears. And I just thought, that's what it's all about. It's not about it's not about top the pops or it's not about who likes you and who doesn't. It's about actually connecting to other people musically and for me that's that's the way that's the easiest way I can communicate with humanity because I really don't relate to a lot of things that are going on in the world I don't relate at all to western society I've always been the outsider since I was a tiny child you know I've always been outside looking in and not liking what I saw in people so I've always been kind of a loner and but never, never, ever felt the need to, you know, I, I, I was never pulled by peer pressure because if I didn't like it, if I didn't want to do it, that was justification enough for me not to. And I could see that I don't want to be like you, so I'm not going to do it.
So did you feel pretty comfortable kind of being an outsider uh, at an early age? Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, I was the eldest of seven, so I kind of, like my first, I was only 11 months, sorry, 13 months when my sec, my brother was born. And then my mum had a child every three years. And so there was lots of kids and I was always the helper. But I, because my mum always cradled a baby, my dad looked after the older kids. So I was very close to my dad. That's good. And and I I mean, I, I felt the same way too. From an early age, I felt sort of on the outside of things. And it could be because when I was younger, my parents moved around a bit. So I, I had a hard time uh, getting yeah, comfortable. Yeah, that was the same as me. Yeah. So I, mean, I went to seven different schools and lived oh, in seven wow. different homes by the time I was 11. Crazy. <laughs> That'll do it. It was it was crazy, but to be honest, I didn't I didn't mind. It never affected me in a way that it might, because my best friend I met when I was seven, and I still know her now. You know, and we grew up together. So I was always a one best friend person. I didn't hang out in groups because I found if you were hanging around with a bunch of people, if someone wasn't there with the topic of conversation and people can be so bitchy and I just thought you know like they're just showing to everyone no I mean maybe they were stupid but people are not stupid enough to not think that they're going to be talking about you the night you're not there you know and that's why that's why I just wasn't interested in hanging around with groups of people because it was not sincere when I had my best friend I would have died for that girl I still would you know and we had been in very many situations where I almost did <laughs> because I won't I won't stand a bully but some people some and and maybe it's wiser to step away maybe you're saving your life if you give in but I could never do that I could never be that person I always had to stand up to them and because I'm tiny as well I, I was I've always been way smaller than everyone else in my class for example I'd be maybe the oldest in the class but the smallest you know so I was a target I was a target the first day I went to school I was a target because the teacher put me on a high chair at the front of the class because I was oh, so tiny geez. and because because the teacher did that Instantly, all the kids did not like me, so they would draw on the blackboard and say it was her. You know, so I, I was used to being picked on all the time, but my dad always said, sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. And I lived by that rule, and it's true. And he taught me how to defend myself verbally and physically. And I did, when I was old enough, I did martial arts and stuff, so I continued to teach myself not to be a victim because I will never be anyone's victim. If someone was going to murder me, I would take half of them with me just to make <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm the kind of person that gets into a cab and if it goes a different route, I get my nail polish out and I'm writing on the seats and I've got their number on my arm of the cab, you know. And I don't, I don't take unnecessary chances because I know the evil that's out there. I've seen it. I've held dying people and I'm saying dying plural because that's the truth. I've held dying people in my arms waiting for the ambulance to come when they have been viciously stabbed with an ice skating boot and their lungs collapsed or, you know, terrible things I had to see growing up. No one should have to see that. It was like a war zone, but in a war zone, you, you will either be defeated or you'll become a warrior. And my friend, my best friend, Linda, she said to me, you're a warrior. And I'm not saying this to big myself up because it's a tragic situation to be in. It's not, it's not like I want to be that. It's just like I had to be that. It was survival instinct. And that is a human condition, <laughs> survival instinct. It sounds like that sort of mentality that would act uh, cause you to act in situations that other people might 
think one more thought past what you did and choose not to act, that acting on that thought probably made you a fantastic practicer of magic later on because that is really, in, in many ways, what, what magic is about is taking the elements of a situation and uh, sort Turning of... Turning it around and... Yeah, yeah, to, shaping yeah. it. Yeah, well, people, people quite, quite often say to me, when did you... When did you become a witch, for example? Or when did you get into magic? And my answer is, I was born that way. You know, and it's really true. It is really true because things happened when I was a small child. And also, I was always interested in things that, I mean, I was a tiny little girl with pigtails and people would say, oh, to my mum, oh, she's so cute. And then after a a while of chatting I didn't often say much but if I did they would come out with, she's an awful morbid little girl wasn't she <laughs> <laughs> and it was just because I was always interested in the dark things of the things that people didn't talk about sure you know and it, because who's interest I mean I always had an inquisitive mind I always knew there were other things going on. I always knew, I mean, he used to say to people when I would sit down as a child, so you can imagine the, the kind of reaction I got, but I would say, you know, there is so much going on between me and that wall there that we can't see. And people would just think I was crazy. <laughs> but it's just like, I just knew, I actually thought, I think I thought I sort of like invented metaphysics and, and all that stuff when I was a kid because nobody else talked about it. None of my peers talked about things like that. But to me, they weren't something that I'd picked up and read. They were just some things that I knew. I just knew it to be true. Did, did your family, I mean, were they kind of the same way? They, they, they kind of just looked at you cockeyed and, and said, okay, whatever rose. Or did yes, you come from a magical... No, I came from a very pretty strict Catholic family, Uh (laughs) the complete opposite. Uh So, which, but also there are Romany Gypsy gypsy on my mother's side. Her dad's family were down, were Romany Gypsy. So I think maybe that's where I get that I don't mind moving around because I actually still to this day go off in my car and just, on my own and I have a bed in the back of it and I just sleep, park where I want, sleep where I want. And it's just that sense of freedom is kind of, I feel oppressed when I'm inside somewhere for too long, unless it is absolutely in tune with me, which my house at the moment is not because I've moved into it and haven't unpacked everything yet. So driving off in the car is great because I can park under trees, I can you know, I can just be free and I've got people to me are an encumbrance sometimes. <laughs> sure. Well, the, the Romani... Especially when... Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Well, especially when they're, when they're, you know, when they're always pointing at you and calling you a weirdo, like, <laughs> like from when you're really, really young, you know, it's like water off a duck's back. I mean, so what? What are you... You know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. Once you figure out that most people's problem with you is just their own projected bullshit and that it exactly. really doesn't it's have their anything ignorance to do with it. And yeah. Because they're all going with the flow, aren't they? They're all sort of dumped in the society and they're just joining the dots to get on. Do you know? I've never felt that way. I've never thought I never aspire to get in that job, get in that house, get in that car. That's a load of bullshit to me, to be honest. It's like, I just think the whole purpose of being alive is to enjoy your life, not to be a slave to the society that you're in. And even when I when I was pregnant with my first child, like Drew McDowell, like my husband, that's like he wasn't happy in his job. And most men, you know, they want to get a job, they've got a baby coming, they really want to... Most pe- women want their men to work hard and provide and I just said to him if you're unhappy just leave just stop and that that was not the way most people thought but I just thought I would 
I would rather he was happy than he was miserable in a job he didn't like. And of course, there was no pressure for me for him to sort of provide for us because we were in a partnership, you know. And so I just, I've never thought that way. I've never been like that. And also my mum and dad were quite often swapped roles. You know, sometimes my dad was working, sometimes my mum was. So the other one would be at home looking after the kids. And it was not always mum. It was sometimes dad, you know, and sometimes they both worked different different shifts so that you know and sometimes I was kept off school to babysit because my parents had to work and we were very poor so it was like I might have missed out on some things but in another way I gained in a lot of areas. Sure absolutely that's that's the thing the things that are tough for a kid are often the very things that make them a more multi-dimensional, more capable and confident uh, adult or mature person. Yeah, because you tend to in in a sort of chaotic, chaotic world, which mine certainly was growing up. It's like you have way more experiences than people who just do the regular, you know. Yes. Getting up, go to school, do, 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 when you finish school, getting up, going to university, do, 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 getting up, going to work. You know, I was never prepared to give a third of my life to any company or anyone. And that was one of my arguments, or one of my points to Drew was, you know, you've got a third, a third of your life you're working, a third of your life you're sleeping, a third of your life you're too tired to do anything else because you've been working. And I was saying, well, you know, cut out that. You know, you're, you're not a slave to any company. You're not, you, and I t- always tell, taught my kids, you know, if you, whatever you do, make sure it's something you love because of that third of your life is so precious. Have you been lucky enough since, I mean, uh, the poems, I'm not sure how popular that band was because I've, I've not heard much about that. Uh, but after Strawberry Switchblade, which I know was very popular, were you pretty much able to sort of make a living by doing music? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's a struggle and especially now it's a struggle. But, you know, I guess because of music, it kind of got me out of a lifestyle that I was used, that I grew up yeah, with. sure. You know, I moved from Glasgow to London, which meant my child did not grow up in, in the same way I did. So it kind of made their lives a bit better. And also it took me out of the chaos because I I was traumatized by my, by my, up, not my upbringing, but by what was around me when I was growing up. I was extremely traumatized by that. I'm not saying I'm tough and I survived that. I did survive that, but it was really traumatic and I still suffer from that now. I have post-traumatic stress disorder, but that is also the thing that keeps me going. It's also the thing that if someone confronts me, if someone was going to attack me, for example, I won't I'll get fight, flight, I'll go straight to fight, flight. And it's like, and usually I don't run. I mean, I was always told running is the best option. My dad always taught me that and I'm a good runner, so I can run. <laughs> but if someone has cornered me, seriously, they, will be re- they won't know what hit them because I don't look like what I'm capable of. And <clears throat> I'm not boasting about being violent because I hate violence. I hate it. But just don't pick on me because the post-traumatic stress thing has made me, has cut out that bit where you're, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I don't have time to think, what do I do? My brain just goes, kick straight into it. And often I come out of situations with a lot of blank spots, a lot of I don't remember who was there. I don't remember that. I don't remember anything. But I've just, I was in a bad place and I'm I'm out of it now. And sometimes it is, I've kind of blacked out. And that scares me more than it probably scared the other person. Because I don't know 
what could happen in a situation like that. So it's quite, it's really scary, like, because I'm not in control. It's like I've kind of flipped, you know, because my whole thing about I will not tolerate a bully, I won't because my brother was murdered by bullies, bullies. And I think my head, my brain at that point just went never again. Not consciously, unconsciously, because who would who would want to be in a situ a bad situation? No one wants to be in that. But even if I see someone being attacked by a group of people, I'm always the one that stands up for them because I can't see it. It makes me sick to see it. It makes me sick when people stand around and watch. And there are loads of people there. You could easily stop these three guys from picking on that one guy. But nobody says anything. And I, I'm always the one that steps in. I might walk away with my head split open or something. But at least I've done what I think all of those people should have done. Absolutely. And that's often why those people behave that way is because nobody has pushed back. Nobody stood up to them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was one situation where I, the one that I was sort of talking about there, where I was stood at the bus stop and there was this guy and there was three really horrible, horrible guys like who were drunk with cans of beer. There was hundreds of people at the bus stops because all the midnight buses were in the same place. And I was 16. I was a punk at the time and very few punks around in Glasgow, to be honest. Nobody liked a punk back then, really. <laughs> and so I was stood at the bus stop on, on my own, but there was lots of other people around and there was these three boys picking on one. And I just, like, flipped out and said, does not make you a big man for three of you to pick on one. That does not make you a man. And I was really, I mean, I was really trying to drop them down verbally because I'm quite good at doing that. <laughs> but this guy's two friends were saying, because he was saying, I'll effing kill you, I'll kill you, blah, blah. And he kept going on. And his friends were going, like, he will. Go, like, just back off. He will, he will. And at first they were fighting as well. But then when they realised how much I was angering this one guy, they started telling me to back off because he would kill me. Kill me. Now he threw, a, he threw his can of beer at me, which hit me on the head. And then fell over the railway bridge <laughs> and my I didn't know I was bleeding but I just felt something my face cold and then some people said she's bleeding she's bleeding and the guy who did it bolted as fast as he possibly could now my thoughts on that was he was probably really was a nasty guy a really nasty guy but he was probably on probation and he could not hang around to finish the job so to speak because the police were going to come now. You're, it got really serious. But in the meantime, the guy I was protecting had got on his bus. <laughs> so <laughs> I was on my own. And oh, then no. it was like, yeah, you know, it was like <laughs> on his bus home. I was like, <laughs> and I just thought, you know what? Most people say to me, don't do that. You put yourself in, in really dangerous situations. But I am not choosing to do that. It's my default setting. And, and it's not because, because I'm a really peaceful person and, you know, I don't want to fight with anybody, but please don't rattle my cage because I will be. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd rather not. I'd rather everybody was nice and everybody could be nice, civil to each other, but we don't live in a world like that, do we? Yeah. Did that? Did those kind of uh, situations decrease once you moved to England? No. <laughs> no, no. Because there's no. all kinds of other trouble there, skinheads and... Well, yes, exactly. We almost get beat up with skinheads in Carnaby Street because we were punks, you know. And it's like, come on. I mean, in Glasgow, it was like the bikers and the whatever, the heavy metal people. That nobody liked punks. And I'm just sitting thinking... Like, we're all on the same side, really. We're all kind of anti-establishment, you know, what is yeah. your problem? Yeah. You know, so even my dad, when I became a punk, he was really, really upset him a lot because I was 
he's a pretty wee girl sort of thing and it was like now I'm wearing black lipstick and stuff and he was like oh like but I did point out to him dad you were a teddy boy you know you were you, you know, you know, and then he would wear like little black suits with his little black tie. And I was going, you, in your day, you were a rebel. And I kind of guessed that sunk in. And he just thought, yeah. And then it was like, come and let me see what you're wearing before you go out. My mum and dad would do that. And just they'd have a good laugh before I went out. You know, <clears throat> but it was better than like... Oh, my, it was better than being kind of ostracised or thought badly of, you know. I don't mind giving my mum and dad a giggle. It's better than them saying, you can't go out dressed like that. But as my, be my best friend, she had to sneak her clothes out and get dressed outside because her dad was a tyrant. Oh, God. Yes, I had those days too. What, what, around what time period was that? Late 70s, early 80s? Late seventies. Late seventies, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was it that led you to music? What led you to start making music and then start making music with other people? Well, I guess punk was the catalyst really, because punk was the time when everything was possible. You know, anyone could do anyone could pick up a guitar and learn anyone could do it. It was, it was kind of e much easier during punk. I mean, at that age, I was just at the age where I was thinking, what am I going to do? I don't fit in in this world. I don't, I can't relate to that. I can't relate to that. I was so isolated at that point where you don't have your family and it's not all fun and games, you know, you're kind of, people try to force you to interact with the world and, and, and I was just like, I can't do this. I'm not that person, you know, and punk happened and it was just like, yeah, I can I can be who I want to be. I have license to be who I want to be now <laughs> without being beaten down at every corner. So it you know, so that was like that's a real sense of freedom. That was like, oh my, that just opened the gates of all possibilities to me. So because when I was a tiny little girl, people would be writing letters to Santa you know, putting them in the post box and I'd be writing letters to the manager because I wanted to be a singer. <laughs> but, and I just thought there was some secret manager out there somewhere that could make it all happen. Uh -huh. And I'd be putting those kind of letters in the post box when I was a tiny little kid. You know? <laughs> Not to Santa, but to the manager. Uh -huh. and, That's <laughs> and more that practical. And that was all that was on. It was all that was on the envelope that <laughs> to the manager, it's like oh, the manager of the world. I was like, I was a very naive little kid, but but I mean, the, the thing about the thing, my imagination was boundless. And I mean, I've had people come up to me and say, "Oh, I don't have any imagination." Just conversation passing, they'll say, "Oh, I don't have any imagination." I was like, "What? Your imagination is the most important." thing the most important maybe some people might call it a gift but whatever it's the most it's one of the most important things about a person is their imagination because it, it's it's on that whole voyage of discovery and you know we're all we're all discoverers through life you know we're all we all want to find answers about this or about that or about whatever it's it's natural to be like that to say you have no imagination it's like Man, it's like cutting yourself off from anything. And I don't think that's true of those people. I just think they just don't get what imagination is. Well, yeah. <laughs> maybe not, because of course you've got an imagination, but it's like to say that is almost like to straighten yourself. Well, some people don't even realize that it's on the menu. Like maybe they have constructed their life where their imagination doesn't play any sort of important role whatsoever. But I think it's something to be fostered. It's like a muscle, you know, the, the mm -hmm. more that you use it, the more powerful it gets and the yeah. more vast and encompassing it can become. Well, my son said to me, I mean, he was eight years old and he came home from school and he said, and he said to me that his friend said, his mum and dad said, don't you think you're a wee bit too old for an imagination? Oh. Now, this was an eight-year-old boy, and my son recognised the tragedy in that. 
Yeah. You know, and he came home and he told me that his friend's parents had said that to him and how, how he thought that was really sad. And I just think, that is a tragedy. It That's is. someone who's going to grow up messed up. Yeah. Because if they're told at eight years old when you should be playing with fairies and all sorts of stuff, you know, it's like, put your imagination on the shelf. You've got to put your head down and work. That seriously... I mean, all work and no play. <laughs> I mean, if you don't have an imagination, how can you discover things? How can you progress in life and in humanity? You know, like, it's, 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 it is sad when people think like that. Yeah, for sure. And it's, you know, it's just the sort of lockstep uh, mentality that we are supposed to attain as a quote-unquote productive member of society. We're supposed to be worried about getting a job that can make a lot of money so we can buy a lot of useless shit that we will leave <laughs> behind when we die. Uh yeah. And that is not happiness. That's maybe pleasure, but that's not something that's going to stay with you. Uh, and, and imagination, because it comes from inside, that's not something that anybody can take from you or yeah, yeah, diminish. It's not going anywhere unless you let someone step on it. And then if you do anything, if you compress anything enough, it will blow up. If you do that with a person something's going to go wrong somewhere in their life. You know, they'll have a breakdown. They'll be very unhappy. They'll never be, they'll never fit well in relationships. You know, it's going to mess them up somehow. I mean, in this society, it's really hard for anybody. And I seriously think that it's hard for anybody to be not messed up in some way. And also, if you've been brought up Catholic, Man, does that mess with your head. Oh, my God, yes. I mean, more perverts, and I, I know that word is a bit of a, mm, where did you draw the line on that word? You know, but more <laughs> more terrible things have happened. Oh, yeah. From Catholicism than anything sure. else. Definitely. You know, and it's like, um, I just I just came to realize, well, my mum said when my brother was murdered, how can God let something like this happen and she never went to chapel again after that but and I actually thought that myself I thought you know I'm scared of God how can you love someone you're scared of so I don't I don't believe in God and if there was and that was, I was quite young but if there was a God they would know I was a good person but I don't believe in this because for one, they always say you have choice. Well, what is the choice? Do what you're told or burn in hell. That's yeah. not a choice. Yeah, exactly. You know, that is not a choice. And to terrify little children. I mean, when I made my confirmation, my Holy Communion confirmation, there was a big bishop coming from Rome. So quite a lot of schools did it in the same day. And when he confirmed me, I made my communion, and I was told I wasn't responsible for my sins in the past, but as of now, I am responsible for my sins. And he slapped me really hard across the face and said, and that's for the sins that have gone before. Just after he said to me, you're not responsible for those sins. What? And I should have made my confirmation at nine, but because it was a special thing, I made my communion and confirmation at seven on the same day. So he did that to a little seven-year-old. I mean, there were children I mean, I was as white as a sheet. I did not see that coming. But there were children crying. There were children weeing themselves, you know. Jeez. And then, like, nobody, not one parent stood up and said, wait a minute. Now, my dad wasn't there. He was looking after the other kids. If he was there, and he was, he went to, to mass right up till he died, you know. And he always said he's answerable only to the man upstairs. But part of me thinks that that was a wee cloak that he had <laughs> you know he was hiding behind that because after my brother died was killed murdered I'm not going to put it any in a pleasant way because it was not a pleasant thing he was murdered and after that my dad was a very broken man because he'd lost two of his own siblings and when my brother was murdered at 10 years old broke my dad and he started to drink 
Oh. And by the end of his life, he was an alcoholic. I mean, oh. he had gone on and off alcohol. He was quite, he had quite strong personality, my dad really. But he was kind of broken by the end. And I think this God thing was his excuse so people would get off his back. Do you know what I mean? Sure. He'd say, oh, I'm answerable to him upstairs. Like, well, him upstairs says he doesn't want you to drink. My dad would just laugh. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was, it was like, I think that was just, that was, that was all he had. He didn't, he had a whole lot of kids that he had to look after and he grieved his whole life. I mean, he was scream in his sleep since I was a tiny kid for his mum. And I never knew why. And I didn't know why until I was about 15. And my mum told me that while he was, when he was 16, he was babysitting for his 18-month-old sister. She fell in the fire hmm. when he was warming her bottle. And she died, obviously. And so throughout his life, he had night terrors. And... But my mum never talked about anything. My, my parents never really talked about anything. They never shared things with us, you know, not even practical things, not even my dad said, your mum wants to have a talk to you when I was a teenager. And my mum did not, so she went straight to the kitchen and I went straight to my bedroom because I didn't want to hear it. Because <laughs> we were brought up to be strict Catholic. You didn't talk about sex. I mean, my dad would go to give my mum a hug he would just go to put his arms around her, we'd be behind her and he would be singing to her and he'd go to give her a hug and she'd go, not in front of the children. That's how I grew up, you know, <laughs> really repressed, really like, you know, it's like, man, I don't, so I was very naive in that sense growing up, but there was a whole side of the world that I knew way more about than anybody else. Sure, sure. Because I did have a vibrant imagination. Yes, and I, I, I would imagine uh, the your imagination was very helpful uh, in your childhood when it wasn't so pleasant uh, in your environment. Hmm. I think it uh, there was something I don't know what it was, but there was something that enabled me to survive everything that I went through. I never really sort of sat down and thought. It was that, it was that, it was that, and it was that. It was just, I don't know. I just had something in me that helped me to cope and survive it all and not to become like those people. I mean, none of my family became like those people, but, you know, most families around us were kind of like that because we were poor. We, were po we lived in a very poor area, which tended to be a lot of gangs and stuff and gangland glasgow in the 70s was not a nice place at all yeah i can imagine so uh the poems so they were a punk rock band no they weren't actually we no i, I didn't mean it like that like no. <laughs> that's Excuse just me. the environment <laughs> No, that's the environment we gotcha. came into, but we were kind of more into kind of world music is what, oh. probably what Drew would have, what Drew did say at the time, you know, it was more like, it's like he was the front man, I was the drummer, I sang a bit as well, but basically from behind the drums, and we were kind of, we were pretty alternative, we weren't really like... We weren't like the thrashy punk bands or anything, you know. We were, we were very. I mean, basically, we were learning as we went along. But he had things he wanted to say. I had things I wanted to express. We were just doing that. We were just being free, really. We weren't. To be honest, I mean, punk was a catalyst, but it was the post-punk music that was much better. Than, than the punk stuff. I mean, it was what came out of punk. It was the opportunities punk opened up for people that, that came out with bands like the Buzzcocks or, you know, stuff like that, you know, that was like not punky at all, but it was way more melodic. And I was, oh, I've always been into melody. Melody's yes, my thing. Absolutely. 
That's why I can't stand most of the music of the 90s, because it's so amelodic, at least in America, like Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and all that stuff. It just doesn't do anything for me. And it sounds very, like Weezer. It sounds very whiny and monotone. But yes, melody is, is magical. I got really disheartened in the, in the, in the 90s when, yes. you know, because I'd go to all the sort of indie clubs and everything. And then suddenly it was Acid House. And everybody was taking ecstasy and going to clubs. But oh, this is amazing! But everything sounds the fucking same. But they were going, no, no, this is amazing. This is amazing. You're too off your head to even hear it, you yeah, know. Exactly. And they were saying like, they were saying, oh, oh, everybody loves each other. And I was going, no, they don't. That person you met last night, you're never going to see them again. How can that be? You know, it's the drugs talking. Don't. And somebody said to me, it's just like punk again. And wow, did I slam them down verbally. It was like, this is nothing like, this is toe in the line. You know, like the government could be dishing out ecstasy just to keep you there quiet and safe exactly. and out of trouble. Yes. You know, this is nothing like punk. And I was, I stopped going out then. Because it was like, oh, there's no way you could go that played the music that I liked. Unless I would go to some goth industrial place that stayed open all Saturday night and you know, let the doors out and all the, all the creepy folk would be crawling out, out of the club on a Sunday morning, freaking society out. I kind of ended up going there because there they would play. They would play kind of, well, they play a lot of goth stuff, and but they play industrial stuff as well. When they play the Mary Chain and, you know, I, I would dance. Mary Chain, I love the Mary Chain. I would dance Cabaret Voltaire, Nag Nag Nag. I love that, you know. So that was the only place, though, that that you could go if you wanted to go out and have a night out like that, you know, if you wanted to go dancing or something. But sure. How, how long did the, the bat cave last? Oh, God. I, I, my memory's terrible for dates, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, lasts, it lasted for quite a while. But, but I mean, the, the, other, the, other, the club that was actually, in those days, it was a squat club, you know. It, it, it wasn't legal. You had to take your own alcohol and stuff like that. And it could be raided and you could be turfed out any time. It's still going, but it has a license now. And some of the people that went to that way back then, like <laughs> when I used to go way back then, still go. And it's like, it, it's, it's awesome that, that that club, it is now legal. It does have a license now and it's bounces on the door and stuff. But, it's still alive. It's called Slime Light. <laughs> and people come from all, all over to go to Slime Light. You know, film crews go there if they want if they want a scene where there's industrial gothic sort of dance scene in a film. They'll go to the Slime Light and they'll, you know, they'll sort of film a wee bit in there. And it's, I think it's amazing. But it's sad in some ways, <laughs> really amazing in other ways, that there's people that are still going there that went when it first opened. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It's still sort of, sort of flogging the, the carcass of the dead horse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I mean, punk rock bands who are still punk rock yeah. bands now, yeah. I think, seriously? I mean, it was kind of, that was just to open the door. You were meant to progress. It's <laughs> you've become the star stagnant pool of decay that punk was meant to free you from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once you start wearing the uniform, the leather jacket and the mohawk, it's like, it doesn't, it's not about that at all. It's not about that. It's about innovation. It's about taking things exactly. to new places. It's about being independent. And Yeah, and all the people that were shocked with me coming from Strawberry Switchblade, the pop band, isn't what were those weird people like? What were those weird? And I would say to them, you know, what? they were more scared of me than I was of them. <laughs> <laughs> All these strange, weird people. That I, I'm the one that was leading them astray. I'm the one that was dragging them on the top of the hotel in Tokyo <laughs> and egging Tokyo, you know, declaring water on Tokyo with dozens of eggs that we bought from the shop across the road. Me and Boyd Rice were on the roof egg in Tokyo, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, and, you know, I, I was, I think I was 
it's this kind of wild element in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ooh, there's a, I hear an owl outside my window. I love the sound oh, of lovely. owls. Yeah. Oh, me too. Um, so yeah, how did you go from Strawberry Switchblade to the more esoteric circle of musicians and personalities that you later would get into? Um, was, am I correct to say that David Tibet was sort of the first one that you met in that circle? No, um, Paul Hampshire B, who was in a band called Into the Circle, in, Into a Circle, and Getty with Fear, and he also worked with Genesis Peoris at the time. I knew him first, and then, well, I kind of had met Jen as well. So, it, see, working with all those people was just becoming friends with all those people. I just met them through other friends and then we just got on. It was just natural to work with them. They were doing music, so um, why not? And it was stuff because, I mean, I tended to work, I've worked with loads of people in different, not too many genres, but a few genres. I mean, I've worked with Bronski Beat, and they're not exactly coil. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, for sure. And I've worked with the Pastels, and I've worked with the Mary Chain, and I've worked Boyd Rice. I've worked with lots of different people from all walks of life because I don't have brackets or around me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have boundaries. I make my own boundaries and I like what I like, which is completely eclectic. You know, I mean, my favorite music, to be honest, is music of the 60s. And my favorite era for fashion was the 60s as well. Yeah, yeah. But, I can relate to that. Yeah, but I, I like all sorts of things, and I do have, I do dislike a lot of things as well. But <laughs> I used to say I hated heavy metal, but now <clears throat> I actually don't hate anything. I might not like it or play with it, but I think hate is a bit of a strong word, and also it sells millions, so lots of people like it. Like it, so. It's valid, do you know what I mean? Who am I to, to sort of say, that's not good, that's not good, that's not good. I might not like it. It might not do anything for me, but somebody else does, and that's fine. <laughs> We're not here to dictate to people. Absolutely. Well, th going back to that, that circle of people that were your friends, that... Th there was definitely something going on there uh, that wasn't happening in, say, the pop, top of the pops world by any means. There was a lot more going on than just a bunch of people getting together and putting out albums. There was, there were, were magical systems, there were philosophies, there were people who were actually taking or trying to take an active part in changing their reality. Uh, mm -hmm. Did that did that pull you in too, uh, along with just... Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. When I met Tibet, I thought he was one of the most fascinating people that I'd met because he was very interesting and he had a vast amount of knowledge about a lot of things. And at the time, he was taking a lot of speed, so he talked a lot. <laughs> 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 I mean, this is not... He wouldn't be annoyed I said that. He said it to people himself. So I'm not sort of like sort of talking behind him his back and anything but he was, he was at that at that point he was taking a lot of speed so he was mr charbox but he was fascinating he was really interesting and it that friendship was like we were very 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 close for a long time and because i, I actually admired him and what he did and i always admired people who kind of did their own thing in spite of other people and Tibet was kind of he was just an interesting guy he had he had a, a lot of knowledge he was very well read and so he had an, a lot of knowledge that was even new to me because like a lot of my world was not necessarily perceived through books and things although some of it would it was but it was kind of more 
by experience. But Tibet was very well read in lots of different things. And although I kind of like sort of the kind of person that dips into a lot of things, but is a master of none kind of thing, but I can't kind of push myself into a corner. I'm interested too much to, you know, to sort of channel myself just in one direction. I think I'd get very bored very easy if I did that. So I think like, and also Tibet's whole lifestyle, being in a boarding school when he was a kid, it's a different world for me. I mean, if I'd been sent to a boarding school, I would have thought I'd been thrown away. My family didn't want me. You know, I would not have thought they were doing anything good for me. I would have felt abandoned. I would have felt really abandoned because I was used to having my family around me. So kind of hearing stories about that and well, way more than that, but it, it was—it was just—it was an—it in, was just a really interesting guy. I mean, for God's sake, he got me up at six o'clock in the morning to go swimming. Nobody can do that. I like <laughs> my bed, <laughs> you know. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, so, right? Well, meet tomorrow and go swimming at six o'clock. I'm going to six o'clock. Well, you would have probably gone earlier if I'd have, if I'd. Have, let them go. <laughs> it's like there are limits. I don't go to my bed until that time, you know. Uh-huh. But he was very disciplined. He would get up, you know, at this time to do his ritual, go to sleep and get up at that time to do his ritual. He did it, you know, he was very dogmatic and very sort of like in, in, with his magic, where I was way more chaotic and spontaneous with mine. And I think. Rigidity never suited me. I'm not good at that.
did uh, did you meet him before? Well, you said you met Genesis first, right? So yeah, I met I met Genesis first. I, I met um, B, but I met I didn't actually I didn't like Genesis. Didn't know him. Didn't think I liked him. And then I thought, oh, I'll give him a chance, right? So I met him, and he was like, he was super nice. But to me, that was too nice, if you know what I mean. It's like it was a bit insipid. But, you know, Drew was really in, into them and stuff, so it's like, right, we'll see. But And I did I really enjoy working with him because, I mean, Alex Ferguson, he was like, I mean, when I was a little punk in Glasgow, like, I went to see... Um, Craig, you the band again. Alternative TV. Alternative TV, yeah. I just got a bit of a brain block there. I went to see Alternative TV, who were supporting Chelsea. And I thought, my God, the support band was way better than Chelsea. And also I thought, I couldn't take my eyes off Alex Ferguson's fingers and his guitar, because he was just, he was a brilliant guitar player. So the album that I worked on with Psych TV, or most all the work I think we did that I did with Psyche TV. Alex was there, and he's a pop genius. That guy, I mean, he's he writes hundreds of songs. I mean, he's he's gone underground right now, more underground than everybody who's underground. <laughs> the, <laughs> I mean, these we days, can't you mean? Find him. <laughs> Sorry. These days, you mean he's underground? Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, he's like. He's ma he's living in Berlin, I think, and he's married with two a set of twins. I haven't heard from him for a long time, but um, the last time he was working, I was went on tour with him, and, and it was just him and I really. We did a few one, sort of one-off festivals and things like that, cool. just two guitars and vocals, and. <laughs> I loved working with Alex. He's a very strange little character. <laughs> I mean, people think they're weird, they're weird, they're weird. No, Alex Ferguson. <laughs> now, he's strange and that's coming from me. <laughs> but strange in the best possible way, you know. Sure. He's like such a, he's quirky, you know. I just really got on really well with him. Um, but working with Psychic TV, yeah, I sort of did work with him. But, you know, there was a whole temple of psychic youth and all of that sort of stuff that wasn't my cup of tea <laughs> because I don't join groups I don't join cults which of course I think that is and I know a lot of people will be offended or upset by me saying that because you know a lot of people were into that and it was an alternative scene and they belonged to it and they became a psychic youth, but I always, I mean, I don't, you might be one for all I know, you may have been one, but it's just, I always thought that it was just another flock, you know, it's just all the little black sheep, but they're still following the shepherd, so to speak, they're not really, the whole thing about being the black sheep was you were the, you were not the same as everybody else, but it was people feeling the need to belong, I don't know if I ever had that. I don't, I always had, to, I was very, very close to my family and didn't like having sleepovers or anything. Well, I had two in my life and I was never allowed to do it again because I freaked them out. <laughs> so, <laughs> one, I had a nightmare and I used to have this recurring nightmare and it was a woman lying beside me in bed on fire and she was, and she was burning up and the more she burnt, the more she cackled and the louder it got and I had that nightmare at, at my next door, the, the, the building next to us. And they had to get my mum at two o'clock in the morning because they couldn't get me out of it. And I was screaming and I was scratching the walls where the woman was on fire. And they had wood chip wallpaper. So my, I just scratched all the wallpaper off and my nails were torn and my fingers were bleeding. And wow. it took my mum to get me out of that. And... The other sleepover was on the other side of the building, a neighbour there, and I was just like, we were sharing a bed, and I was just like telling her what she, what I was seeing in the room and in her face, 
and telling her she, all the different people she was morphing into, all these different things that I was seeing in the dark. Wow. I terrified the life out of her. She was <laughs> a, a couple of years older than me, and I was never allowed to stay there again. <laughs> But that was the thing. I would be the little kid in bed saying, ghosts, please come and see me. I'm friendly. I'd be telling the ghosts that I was friendly and they shouldn't be scared to show themselves because I want to see you. <laughs> and I don't think that went down well with a lot yeah, of people. <laughs> exactly. Did you did you see ghosts when you were young? Yeah. Or do you still? Yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you like, a story. This is when I was very young. My brothers and I were playing tag you know like tag or whatever i don't know what you call it in america we're just chasing each other and the one that gets caught has to chase the other ones and i was running after my brother and he slammed the door and it the living room door and it hit me in the face and my nose just burst (laughs) it's bleeding everywhere and i screamed so loud that the wall burst into flames what? Where my mum was stood. I swear to God, I, well, not God, but I swear to the universe wow. or whatever, the wall burst into flames. Now, in that same house, it happened again. Same situation, my brother and I play, playing like tag and the front door of the house. And those buildings were built solid, like granite, you know, and the doorknob was brass, solid brass, and it just slammed open and the brass handle went straight into the wall when I screamed. And the man downstairs came out because he heard it and my mum ran to the door, my dad was working. My mum ran to the door and the man downstairs said, no one's passed here. And like, so when I was 16, my mum actually told me I was mad. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think my mum was <laughs> used to think like because we'd go for a walk and she'd think she saw something in the graveyard and I would be all so interested you know like oh like something in the graveyard and she would grab me by the hand and bolt up the street <laughs> and I'm like ah, I wasn't allowed to see it because my mum was too scared <laughs> but things like that happened when I was a kid and also like something happened when I was an adult when I lived in Muswell Hill and my daughter Kerry, we were in the bathroom and I was just like singing, just just notes, you know, I was just choosing a note and going, oh, or whatever, you know, I was just like, and I just hit the frequency off the bat of that room and I could feel the air vibrating and I could feel the whole room. I mean, the it was it was bizarre hitting the right frequency for that room. My daughter bursted it into tears she was only six but she obviously could feel it as well but she had no com- comprehension of what it was so it freaked her out and so she burst into tears and i stopped doing it but wow. you know it was just finding the frequency of that room and it was just like i think maybe that's what was happening when i was really really young you know it could have been yeah, because for sure. there was a vocal exhalation for me and these things happened so you tell people that and they go, yeah, right. But why would I lie about that? I don't want to look like an idiot. It yeah, happened exactly. and I don't care if people believe you, believe me or not. You know, it's just like, so that's why when I, when people say, when, when did you become a witch? When did you get in? I was born that way. <laughs> you know, I came into the world that way. I haven't done anything to change I've just followed my flow of life. Did you do you know anything about your ancestors? Were did were, were any of them practitioners? Well, as I said before, that on my mother's side, her, my granddad on my mother's side's mother, was the last the, the traveling line of Romany gypsies. She left her caravan and moved to Scotland and settled there. So. There's Roman Gypsy in the family. And what's really kind of weird is, uh, it's not weird, I think it's funny, to be honest. But, you know, when you're a Catholic, you're not supposed to have false idols. You're not supposed to be superstitious. You're not, you know, all of that stuff. You, it's irrelevant if you're a Catholic. But my mum was one of the most superstitious pe- persons I knew. 
don't put your shoe, new shoes on a table. If a black cat crosses the road, you know, oh, it's bad luck, this is bad luck, that's bad luck. And I kind of embrace number 13. You know, I embrace all those things because I want that energy. Yeah, <laughs> and sure. It's like, and it's like one of my really good friends killed himself in 89 and he jumped in front of a train now, he always signed his name. His name is Adam. And he always just signed it with a little A and a little panther paw. So whenever I see him, and he always told me that when, because he thought he was going to die when he was 23 anyway. So whenever he dies, he will always look out, look out for me. And so whenever a cat, a black cat, crosses my path and I'm driving down the road, I say, hello, Adam. <laughs> I don't think, oh, my God, bad luck. I just say, Hi, Adam. You know, because <laughs> that's who it is. And I seriously must have guardians looking after me because I've got myself in so many bad situations and come out of them alive. You know, not necessarily tried to get into them, but I've been in them, you know, and I've survived. I've survived car crashes that nobody's walked away from that. The police, the ambulance, the fire base have all said, where's the driver? She's sitting over here thinking that I was just, you know, I don't know. I must have angels looking after me, but I've taught, told myself now, don't be reckless just because of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? don't, don't count on that. Yeah, don't be count on it because never never take anything for granted. Yeah, exactly. Because who knows what's around the corner. For, for sure. Well, have you ever seen anybody, any family member or a friend or anything that has passed on? Um, I saw my little brother and I, and I saw Adam as well. I actually conjured Adam, to be honest, um, because I didn't deal with it. I don't deal with death well at all. I mean, I might sound that like I'm quite tough and I can deal with all sorts, but I actually cry a lot. I'm very sensitive as well, you know, and I don't, I don't deal with death well at all. But I think that's because part, probably mostly because of the traumas of my wee brother dying. I was only 11 when he died. So, and I was a very young 11. I was always younger than my years in some ways, but wiser in other ways, you know. But so I don't deal with death very well. And I was doing a ritual at home once and I conjured Adam up through the mirror and he came first I mean he appeared as static it wasn't I couldn't see a person there I could see the shape of a body but it was like static it's like billions of little stars you know and it's like and he came into the room and we danced oh, wow. together yeah. and then he went away telling me that everything was okay. Everything was going to be okay. And actually I had a fire in my room that night. <laughs> wow. What, what because, from what? How did that happen? Well, it was little tea light candles that were on the table. And I had this little, it was like, it was like a cow's little, a milk, cow milking stool, you know, the stool that people sit on when they're, milking cows, it was one of them. And I had a little circle of candles and some things on the table that were relevant to what I was doing. And where, sometimes when you get wrapped up in magic or a ritual of some sort, you kind of are almost not in the place your feet are standing on, if you know what I mean. You've left that, you've kind of lifted yourself from the, confines of a room or a place or the earth or whatever you've diff entered a different realm a different frequency frequency a different parallel whatever you know you're just not quite bound to what you are and it's like while i was out there the table went on fire and but to me that was all part of like in magic when you gain things you often have to sacrifice Sure. You know, so it's a bit of give and take. Like if I'm going to climb a tree, I will cut myself, put a bit of blood on the tree as an offering to the tree because I'm just about to 
claim you. And so I've been like that since I was a wee kid, you know. It's always, if you're going to do that to that, you have to give it something of yours that's precious. And so I was into magic before I even knew what people meant by that, you know, since I was a little kid, you know, because you never take things for granted and you don't, you don't take people for granted, but things like everything that's living has an energy. I mean, things that, that don't, that are not living, everything has an energy, you know, and who's to say where life and an inanimate object starts and stops, you know, it's like, because everything, the whole universe is an energy and it's, sometimes it's really, it's amazing when you can pass through those parallels, those, you can break from one energetic existence to another and be just as whole there or sometimes even more comfortable there. And quite often I found that going off into the woods at night on my own when I lived in London was, I had the most magical times there. And that, and that was, that was me on my own. I would be charging my crystal balls, my cat, whatever. And at a full moon, I'd often, sometimes I was on acid. <laughs> I was going to ask oh. about psychedelics. <laughs> Leave me alone. Don't pick on me. <laughs> no, that would have been always my drug of choice because all it does is help you to expand that imagination even more. And never had a bad trip because I always planned my trips to a degree, you know, obviously there are other things, but there are, I would keep myself in a safe place. So, but yeah, I, I loved psychedelics because I just thought they were mind expanding and they took me places that I knew about that I hadn't been. Do you know what I mean? So it was like, it was never, never a scary thing for me. It was always a learning thing. It was always like, I've had the same trips as Burroughs or, you know, I've read about and so afterwards, after the fact, and I thought, fuck, the same trip as Manson. Oh, it's a bit weird. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, but I think people do have those trips if they, if they just let themselves go and they become at one with the universe and they are a star. You know, you are. You can feel like, I don't mean a star as in pop star. No, I, I know mean, exactly. Universal. Yeah, yeah. Thing. You know, it's like, we are all stardust and that's where I've gone there, you know, and I've been among the stars and it's the most amazing feeling ever. And I just think like, I mean, I was always getting, I was getting to bed to do it and stuff. Not that he was a, I don't know that he was an acid virgin before that. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> people would take it with me because they felt safe with me. Because oh, yeah. if anybody ever had a, had a bad time, which happens to a lot of people, I am always one that can make them feel safe. Did, so, you, did you ever trip with uh, John Balance? Um... We had mushrooms, but John and I would like, we used to do things like go and sit on the hill and chant. He loved doing that. He loved sitting on the hill and chanting. And we used to love go, going and picking mushrooms. I mean, all sorts of mushrooms. And then like, I'd sort of be dropping my son Bobby off at the scoot at the gate. I lived in a big country estate. And they can in a stable flat that was that belonged to the estate, and John would cut, like I call him Jeff. It's weird calling him John. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> I've always called him Jeff, but like we would we would go, um, take Bobby to the gate, and on the way home pick mushrooms, and then get home, check them with the book, and then fry <laughs> them up for breakfast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. That was one of the wee things that, that John, Jeff and I used to do and sit on the hill and just chant and stuff like that. I mean, it's the first time I met him, it was like, we just hit it off really, really well. And it, like, I was always the person that Sleazy or Peter would call up if Jeff was having a really bad time. And Jeff had a phone under his bed and a room that was just his room that kept his paintings and things in and he'd have a phone under the bed and 
that was his bat phone, but it was a direct line to me. <laughs> we used to joke about that. Mm-hmm. But sometimes when Jeff didn't pick it up himself, because he was having a hard time, like if he was, if he if it was just too much that he couldn't pick up himself, then Peter would pick it up and he would say, "Can you talk to him? I can't get through to him." And then he'd put him on the phone, and then we'd chat for a while, and then he would come round, and it would be better. And, and so I guess I'm a bit. I've kind of always been an agony aunt my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I had two columns in magazines. One was in Tokyo, and I was called Tokyo Rose, and I had an agony aunt column there, and I had a little column that just writing in the magazine. So I lived there for six months, and um, writing about British music. I had a column doing that, and my little agony aunt column, and then there was another fanzine in Britain that that I did uh, Agony Ant column for but I mean that was kind of tuck in, tongue in cheek it wasn't you know wasn't really serious yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to tell people what I really think because <laughs> 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 um, get over it or kill yourself yeah <laughs> exactly not really good for an Agony Ant to see no. that <laughs> Maybe what somebody needs to hear, but yeah. It may be, but, you know, you <laughs> end up getting done for doing something like that. I mean, I was, like, used to go around to London and I'd be coming home from clubs and stuff at night on my own. I carried a starting pistol with me. I mean, it's illegal now. You can't. It's only a sports, you know, one of the sports starting pistols. But I always had, I had have a collection of replicas, and but they're only starting pistols. But I used to take them out with me to dancing or to clubs and stuff. <laughs> and I would like come home one morning at night time. This was the evening when I was in Switchblade. I'd be all ribbons and bows and polka dots and I'd be walking home. And you always get a bunch of guys that are just like drunk and loud mouthed and have to say something catty to you. Like, mm, say something, you know, and I'd just turn around and pull a gun on them and go, fuck off. And most of the time they would go, whoa. But sometimes they wouldn't, and then I'd just point it at the sky and shoot it, uh-huh. and it made such a loud, loud bang. Uh-huh. They were shitting themselves. They would be <laughs> like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. And I held up, oh, my God, I don't even know if I should say this out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I held up a wimpy, which is like a Burger King kind of place. Uh-huh. I went I went in last thing at night. The place was closing. You know, people had just walked out the door held it open for me to walk in, but there was one guy mopping the floor and the other guy told me the fryers are off and I went, could I have a veggie burger, please? The fryers are off. And I said, I just want a veggie burger. They must still be hot. Can I have a veggie burger, please? And I mean, I'm sorry, the fryers are off. The fryers are off. And I, just, I don't know what overcame me, but I just pulled the gun out, didn't I? And I put it on the counter and I pointed at him. And I said, can I have a veggie burger? And can I have it now? <laughs> he went and he made the veggie burger. The guy who was mopping the floor was just stood static the whole time until the veggie <laughs> burger was made. He handed me my veggie burger. I paid for it. And I said, thank you very much. He walks out. And as soon as I get out of the shop, I just like, reality hit me. And I just thought, fuck. And I bolted up the road <laughs> as fast as I could <laughs> with ribbons flying in the wind, like not in disguise at all. I saw this girl and she looked like that. Oh, yeah, we know exactly who she is. <laughs> <laughs> I just ran into the woods. There was never any comeback for me. And I don't, I, I'm not, I'm, honestly, I'm so lucky. I've done so many mad things. I'm just think, how did you get away with that? <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. I wasn't on acid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would have made quite a headline. You can't blame the drug. Yeah. Yeah, you, can, you can't blame the drug, yes. It's your imagination. Yeah. <laughs> that imagination yeah, of sorry, yours. it wasn't the drugs. <laughs> I would be dangerous if I took drugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's um, funny. I mean, most people think the funniest bit is that I paid. <laughs> yeah. That's, well, that just shows like, that... You, that just proves that you never were going to actually do anything. You just, I know, I'm not yeah. a baddie. I mean, exactly. it's obviously the guy can easily drop a veggie burger and I'm not going to get food poisoning. He just exactly. turned it off. It's still hot. <laughs> What's a couple of minutes? Exactly. That was my reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was many people would have agreed. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, back to, we'll say Jeff, because you know him as Jeff. Uh, were you guys mm. still friends when he, when he passed on? Yeah, you know, he talked to me less than two weeks before he died. But, and he was saying, he was really upset on the phone. It was one of those, like, I need to talk to you kind of calls, you know. And it was like, oh, Rose, I'm, I'm like, I don't want to die. And I got like, what are you talking about, Jeff? You're not going to die. What are you talking about? He said, I'm not going to die. I'm going to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And he was really insisting he was going to die. And less than two weeks later, I got a call from Ossian, like a, a friend, to tell me that, and I, I just dropped the phone and screamed. I just like, I couldn't believe it. But Jeff knew he was going to die. He knew. But then Jeff was, he's, he was in touch with it. He was, he saw angels, he was in touch with angels, you know, all that sort of thing. I mean, we, I think we all, life isn't, it's not linear, you know, it's not there's a beginning, a middle and an end. It's like you say, the, chaos, the whole chaos thing. Sometimes we do see our future. Sometimes we do see our past. Sometimes, you know, well, you know what I mean? Sometimes we're not, sometimes some people's minds are way more open to possibilities. I mean, if you if you don't believe in things and you shut yourself off, you're not going to be able to be in touch with those things. But if you're open, if you're mentally open, which Jeff most certainly was, you know, he knew he couldn't not have known. It was it was a one and a half weeks until he died. You know, he could not have known that that was going to happen because he'd never had that conversation with me ever. So he knew he was going to die. And when he did die, that, it was terrible. I, I was inconsolable. But one of the things I was most inconsolable about is the fact that he knew and how even to me, I was saying, you're not going to die. You're not, you know, because he was... He was in quite a panic, and so I was, I was being a friend and ca calming him down and stuff, but part of the grief for me was that he knew, and I didn't take that on board, you know, well, I didn't. You, how were you well, to I, know I, that there was, you Exactly, know, exactly, yeah. but with, like, even, whether you're lapsed Catholic or not, that guilt thing is on your shoulder all the yeah, time. Sure. And it's like also if you have traumas regarding death, you always find a way to blame yourself, you know. Pet 
I know that I'm not responsible for things that I once really thought I was responsible. If I'd done this, if I'd done this, Adam wouldn't have jumped in front of a train. If I'd done this, you know, but no, I, I'm over that now. I don't think like that anymore, Good. but it's part of the whole thing of like taking responsibility for something that's kind of out of your hands. Absolutely. Or trying to make sense of something or, you know, but you really have to realise that. I mean, when my wee brother died at 10 years old, what did he do to deserve that? Yeah. You know, and the thing is, you know what kids are like? Kids squabble, siblings squabble. And I'd said to him the week before, I wish you were dead. And that haunted me for years. But it was just a kid's fight. It had been said a hundred times backwards and forwards between us all. We never meant those words. We just meant, I'm really angry with you literally but he was like I wish you were dead but it didn't mean it to be literal it wasn't literal but for many 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 years I blamed myself because I wished that and as a little child and it was not a narcissistic thing because I was 11 you know it was like I didn't think I have the power to kill or oh, even that makes me think sick saying that. But I really blamed myself for my brother's death. And although it was three boys that did it, you know. And but that whole Catholic thing, that's why I just like I don't just I'm not just a lapsed Catholic. I really hate Catholicism. <laughs> I can't stand that sort of whole control of the masses and controlling people the whole essence of a being with fear. Yeah. I mean, F off. Yeah. I mean, how dare you do that to little children? And I actually, like, <laughs> I was doing a song and it was like, Scott likes and it God go away. And it's called Turn Off the Light. And that's the one that I cried at at the last rehearsal. <laughs> but I was singing it at a gig and then I just went off on a rant. And we were playing in a chapel. <laughs> Maybe that's why I went off on a rant because rant, I just turned around and I started looking at the crucifix and sort of having this conversation with that image. You fucking, like, I was just saying that cause it's child abuse. I mean, if you christen your child, that's abuse because you have that child is growing up from a very small thing with not a lot of information yes. to somebody that's been told this is right, this is right, this is right. And who do you believe? Your mum and your dad, right? They're your protectors. They're bringing you up, telling you God, 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 God is everything and you must obey. That's, that's, that's child abuse. And I just went off and I was screaming and I was like, strike me down, down, down now then, go on, bolt of lightning, bring it on. <laughs> I wasn't exactly seeing those words, but yes, I was. And I was like going mad in this church and people in the audience were just staring at me. Like, so a couple came up to the night and said, you made me my husband's night. <laughs> but I think other people were probably saying, oh, because people were in crucifixes in the audience. I don't think know if that was ironic or not. Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of gods wear crucifixes. Yes. It doesn't mean they're Catholic. Yeah. But they were not inverted, so I don't, 
I may have offended somebody, but I didn't give a shit because, <laughs> <laughs> because this is what I think and I expanded the song a wee bit you know, and I cursed that fucker that curses everybody else. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, my life is a living hell as a child. I used to walk down the street and a priest would be coming towards me and I'd think he could read my mind. But I wasn't a bad child. I was cheeky to my mum and dad, which was always my confession. I mean, once my confession was I was cheeky to my mum and dad and I took a donut, I stole a donut out of my granny's fridge without asking. That was the worst thing I did, you know what I mean? <laughs> Why am I going to hell? <laughs> that doesn't seem quite fair, having a donut back. Exactly. <laughs> and it was like, but how that affects a little child's mind, you yeah. shouldn't ever do that. And I exactly. didn't, didn't bring my kids up religious, and they thank me for it, because they've gone and read all about all the religions, you know, they know more than... I, I was just focusing on Catholicism then, but they've read about everything and they're so glad that I didn't put that on them. But I wouldn't because, I mean, you don't do that to a child. Yeah. I mean, people make their own minds when they grow up. But Jeff, he was like, Jeff and I got on really well, really fun, funnily. Like, I live in the postcode area of the school that he boarded at. <laughs> So it was very strange when he came out to visit, you know, because we'd go mushroom pick and then we'd go visit his old school and and he'd tell me stories about how he used to sneak into one of the Bee Gees over the wall of his house because he had a mini Stonehenge in his garden, <laughs> which was right next to his, Jeff's old school. And, you know, and it's like Jeff and I were really really close i mean i'm close to a lot of my friends but you know some people you just have an unspoken connection sure well sure. jeff that was jeff and i yeah i was reading i was skimming over a little bit of uh england's hidden reverse today and it you i don't know whether it was i think it was you that mentioned that jeff was sort of your doppelganger because you both yeah. would see the same things that other people wouldn't see yeah and we dream the same dreams it was bizarre we were both born in psychiatric hospitals oh wow which is really bizarre because i was in scotland and he was down here somewhere i don't know where he was born actually but he was in a psychiatric hospital i can't remember his story to be honest but my story was it was the first hospital that that my mum had a, a difficult labor with me it was first it was closest hospital happened to be a psychiatric hospital so i by default i was born in a mental hospital a lot of people probably say quite apt but, <laughs> <laughs> but that was it but the funny it was really bizarre that jeff did as well and i just think like we were do like we were, he was the he was the male me if you know i mean it's like sure. we were so in touch spiritually we had such a connection that um, I, I can't explain how much I loved that guy. It was like it was like losing part of you when someone that you're that close to on a spiritual level, not just friendship, when they go away. I don't even like to say the word. That's how like that's how fragile I am when it comes to things like that, you know. Like and I know I know that he's still around. And so I think it's these people that are protecting me. Yeah. You know, I think. I Absolutely. Think, and ancestors, because I've always been protected. I mean, my mum would be stood at the bus stop and she'd turn around and I was about three years old and I wasn't there. But all she had to do was look up because I had been climbing up the building or something. I was such a little climber. I mean, if a dog bit me, my natural reaction was to grab its head and bite it back. When I was a little <laughs> kid, I had to learn not to do these things. But because I was just a natural little creature, you know, it's like I think if it's all the things you're told not to do that train you into being the human you don't want to be. <laughs> and I think if, if something, if somebody bites you, it seems natural to bite them back. So if a dog bit me, I bit it back. <laughs> it freaked the life out of my mum. I think my mum was a wee bit scared of me. My, da my dad wasn't, he kind of embraced it all. He was like, 
I was like the apple of my daddy's eye, really, because I was the only girl for a long time, five brothers, and I had one one sister. But for a long time, I was first born, and I was the only girl for a long time, so I was daddy's little girl. Of course, of course. So, and so he, I kind of probably spent more time with my dad because my mum was always cradling the next baby. When one was out in nappy, she had another, so... Dad taught us all how to swim. Dad took us to the zoo or whatever it was, you know. And so I was very close to my dad. And we he was kind of like my best friend growing up because I didn't, as I say, I was kind of like the wee one that didn't really play with lots of people because I didn't really like them. <laughs> yeah, sure. And they didn't like me anyway. So there was <laughs> you didn't speak each other's language. No, we didn't. It was like... Yeah, you you might as well be from another planet because, exactly. like, and I I still say I'm not a human. You know, I do not relate to humanity at all. Yeah, I can relate. I, I often look around me and go, "What strange behavior these humans exhibit." I I don't relate to it in the least. Exactly. I mean, yeah. it, it's like everything is everything. <laughs> It's like you go and you see people on their first dates and you're sitting there going, is that how people act when they're on a first date? (laughs) It's all tippy-toe and pretentious and watch what you say and and don't say that to me. And I just think, fuck that. I mean, if if you like someone, you've got to be who you are in the beginning because you can't change somewhere down the line to who you really are. It's like... you know, worse and all, you have to be true. I mean, and other people have to be true to you because if you're living someone else's life, they're making your life a lie and no one has the right to make anyone else's life a lie. Yes. And don't. And it takes so much time and energy to pretend that you're somebody else. And often we're yeah. pretending, we're pretending that we're that ideal person that we would like to be instead of who we are right then and there and that's i mean you've got to be loved for who you are in the present not for Absolutely. somebody yeah i mean i i would i don't want to be anybody else yes you know when people say who would you like to be well actually i'm me and i don't i can't imagine what it would be being in that person so i don't i wouldn't take that leap of faith anyway because faith is not a word that i use Now, I've kind of gone, I think I may have gone way extreme with the the kickoff of the Catholic thing because I won't even use the word faith anymore because it sounds too religious. I'll use hope. Hope sounds okay. You can hope for that, but have faith in it? Nah. I mean, that's blind. That's like walking around with your eyes closed, you know, fumbling in the dark, you know. I, I want to see where I'm going. Exactly. It's really funny because my son that set all this up for us tonight, he used to, people laugh because he refers to Peter and call Peter as Uncle Sleazy. (laughs) 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 He's like this wee six-year-old running around going, Uncle Sleazy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, what a great environment to grow up in. People go, what? What? What did you say? (laughs) Yeah, Uncle Slee, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would take my kids to gigs and stuff like that, you know. Like, I mean, gigs that I was playing. Yeah, sure. You know, it's like, don't send, I mean, earlier on, my youngest, like, Kerry, she would come to switch with gigs and stuff like that. And um, I'd, some some people would say, oh, you can't do that, you know, but um, even Jill said at one point, you know, Strawberry Switchblade was a non-starter because I was agoraphobic and Rose had a child. And that really annoyed me <laughs> because having Kerry did not hinder my existence at all. It enriched me having a child of my own and it was enriching for my child to go off to concerts and stuff that other little kids weren't doing, you know turning up at school in a cab after she'd just been on TV with mum. You know, that I think is like, that's not a bad thing. How can you say 
having extra experiences is bad. Like my son Bobby, you know, he'd be serving tea up to placebo at some sort of like festival or something like that. They would be playing at sorrow would be playing that and that was just like that was just his life it wasn't any big deal but everybody else thought oh it was just normal to him he'd be sitting in the dressing room you know playing keyboards and stuff like that backstage you know my daughter velocity she'd run on stage straight after we came off and start singing twinkle twinkle little star <laughs> a bunch That's of great. goths, you know, at uh, some yeah. goth festival. Uh-huh. These goths, and she was running on stage with a wee black frilly dress on and some black wings singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Did you ever play live with uh, Psychic TV or Coil? Yeah. Uh, not Coil, not Coil, but I did with Psychic TV. We did this a gig, it was. It was an all day event, fabulous feast of flowering light. And there was quite a few people. I mean, Bjork, the Sugar Cubes, their band previous to the Sugar Cubes was called Click. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were playing that night. Um, quite a lot. Well, there's quite a lot of people. There's a dance group playing, you know, and it was the virgin prunes were playing it, it was just a really good night it was like quite eclectic and nice like i played with psychic tv because we were doing god star and those songs and i sang all god star and, and those songs around that time anything psychic tv recorded i did with them um so and a lot of people still say oh i didn't know that was you on god star because my name is not put on the record because after that, Jen and I had a falling out. Uh-huh. And it was like, you know, it was, he would introduce me to the temple. Now, I was the only person that actually saw the, the, the nursery, basically, bef- and not having been initiated because you, you weren't allowed to see the nursery unless you were going in there to be initiated and, into the temple of psychic youth, but I was privy to see it. <laughs> but I was always, because and Jen would be saying to me, you know, like sex magic at the point of orgasm, you sort of like imagine what you really want, and I would just, I just turn around and say, it wouldn't be you. <laughs> <laughs> he was so pissed off with me because him and his wife, they had a bet. I, I found out that they had a bet to see which one would bed me first, and I just thought. Fuck off the minute, yeah. the minute you even think about objectifying me, you ain't got a chance in hell, even if I liked you before that. Yeah. But I didn't even like you before that anyway, and I won't be manipulated into your little games. You know, Jen, this is hilarious. Jen, Drew and I went round to visit Paul and Jen when they just moved house. And Jen get down on the floor and start after doing push-ups. And I went, shit. It's like, what's your sign? How many push-ups can you do? You know, he was trying to impress me, and I just thought, that's pathetic. Who does that? So I went down. He did, he did 10 push-ups. I went down and did 50 or 100. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go for the 100 because I can't remember, and I tend not to exaggerate. You know, I'll go below it. So, and I did 50. He got really pissed off because <laughs> Drew and Paul over there. So then he said, you want to spar for a wee bit? So we were sparring, you know. Like he did martial arts as well. And he whacked me in the arm really, really hard. And it was meant to be friendly. It wasn't meant to be full on. And I said, you did that deliberately, didn't you? And he went, no, no, no. So I just dropped him. I just like <laughs> <laughs> grabbed him, flew him over my shoulders and dropped him to the floor. And wow. I said, you did it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, seriously, it's a bit pathetic doing the 10 push-ups yeah, in the first place. Exactly. But I mean, I mean, what man does that? That's like a frat boy. Uh, that's kind of sad, isn't it? Yeah. I know, I know. It's like, I don't, it's like, if people did in the 70s, it wouldn't have been cool, you know? <laughs> it's certainly not cool now, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, but, you know, I think, I think I was like a bit of a thorn Jen's side because even when Sora went to New York, we were playing with the Majesty, not with them, but on the same bill. And, I hadn't seen Jen for years. 
and he came up the venue, it was empty, it was like, you know, before sound check, and I was sat in the corner, I quite often sit on my own in dark corners, <laughs> and I was sat in this corner, and Jen came walking over, and he had a black bot, Bob, and I hadn't seen him for a while, I didn't really know it was him in the dark, and, until I heard his voice, and he said, oh Rose, it's lovely to see you, and I just looked at him and I said, I'm sorry, I can't say the same. And nobody says that to Jen. Everybody's all kiss ass with Jen, you know. And I just said, I'm sorry, I can't say the same. And he said, oh, what do you mean? I went, well, you know, I don't, I never bear grudges. I don't, it's a waste of time holding on to bad feelings. But I do have a memory. And I remember of what you said about me and what things you did that were, they were completely uncool. It's, he started this rumour that I was on drugs and it was drugs that I would never take, right? Yeah, sure. And, and it was like, you fucking half, why, why would you, why would you be so damning to some, somebody, do you know what I mean? And when they were on tour, when Psyche TV were on tour, well, actually, the end of that story was I made Jen cry. It was crying. <laughs> and wow. then all night in the dressing room, he kept sitting beside me and trying to be all friendly and, everything and of course I spoke to him I don't I don't I really don't bear grudges but I'm just saying you know it's I'm not your friend you know I told him I'm not your friend you know I like I do have a memory I won't be a grudge you know don't you can't play you can't play me like you can play everybody else but you know when he was on tour with Psychic TV um Drew was the tour manager and Jen said something not nice about me. And he was sitting directly behind Drew. And Drew was driving the tour bus. And Drew put his foot on the brake really quickly, swung around and punched Jen in the face. <laughs> and then got off the bus and said, I'm off the tour. Now, it was Alex Ferguson that had to persuade Drew to go back in. And Jen apologised to him for saying that to me. Now, Drew and I were split up by then. We'd been split up for a few years. But he had my back and he knew the truth. And he wasn't having Jen do it. He wasn't going to let Jen away with doing something like that. And it's like I had, I was in on Hampstead Heath with a couple of friends just a few nights before. And I had climbed to the top of this tree and I was singing like a lark up there. But I fell, and I fell 50 foot out of a tree. Holy and shit. And I broke three ribs, had concussion. Like, it it, it was really dark. It was in the middle of the night, basically, but there was a full moon. So as I was falling, I could see how far I was from the ground. And I thought, because it was amazing at first, just because it actually was on the way up. Ascending the tree, I was taking my clothes off, so I was naked by the time I got to the top. <laughs> and then, so when I fell, I was just falling, and I was just like, "Wow, this is amazing feeling!" The air rush past your body and through your hair, and it was just like, "Wow, this feels awesome!" And I just looked and thought, "Fuck, you are miles from the ground. You better start grabbing." So Aww. I started trying to grab things on the way down, and Barry, who is an into a circle with B. He was at the top of the tree shouting, Rose has just fallen out of the tree. If she lands, she's going to break her neck. <laughs> and B, I could hear him rustling in the leaves down at the bottom of the tree as I was falling, trying to catch, wait for me to fall. <laughs> I'd have killed him if he'd, if, he'd caught, if he'd caught me. But I actually landed in the tree about, I don't know, about 10 foot off the ground or a wee bit more, but then I had to get off that branch to the floor with broken ribs. Oh, man. And that was so painful. And, but, like, it was, um, I think it was, like, the relationship between B and I was what Jen was really, really jealous of. And that's why he wanted to initiate me and stuff like that. And when I said, well, I, w I wouldn't be thinking about you, and he knew I meant I'd be thinking about B. <laughs> yes. So he decided to put a curse on us. Uh -huh. <clears throat> she was one of the... And like I a, said... Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, no, no, like B, Jen decided to put a curse on B and I. And I just I said, like, are you joking? I'm not scared of a curse from Jen. I'm 
we, my love, my power is way more powerful than anything nasty and negative than he can throw at me. It's just going to bounce off. So he didn't phase me at all, but he faced a lot of people with his threats of curses and things like that. But, you know, you can't, a person can't hide behind that. You can't, it'll come back and slap you in the face, you know. Absolutely. Like if, you're, if you're going to be nasty to people who are like, especially if they're totally undeserving, then it's just going to come back and slap you in the face at some time, you know. It's not a, got, it's not a, it's not a wise road to travel. Absolutely. And I hear that later on he sort of reformed. There was a couple of friends of mine, Mr. Greg and Dieter, and he went to my friend Dieter, who was a Romani sort of magician, and he was seeking sort of advice on how he could practice his magic in a less sort of narcissistic, ego-based way. So I don't know if he ever for lack of a better term, repented and stopped behaving that way. But I think at one point he at least attempted to, at least he had a moment of reflection thinking. Well, that, I was, I was told by B, like a mutual friend that he did change a lot. He changed an awful lot and he wasn't the person that he used to be towards the end. Now, like, Je I never ever made up with Jen. We never became friends again, but we were never enemies. You know, it's a waste of time having enemies. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's like, so, you know, I would chat to him sometimes, but then other times I would like be cheeky. But I mean, if you know me, you know my sense of humor is quite cheeky. You know, like Jen put a picture up on Facebook saying, oh, this was for the fashion show this and I did my makeup for such and such and everybody would be like, oh, gorgeously beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And I would just say, get your money back. <laughs> <laughs> and, but Jen knows it and anybody that knows me knows that. I, I just, I'm just, a, my sense of humour isn't quite like everybody else. <laughs> you know, it's like, but people wouldn't, you wouldn't have been offended with me by that, with me because of that. I mean, other people said, I've said things like, even when I've said, I've called Alan McGee, the, the guy that sort of created creation records, I'd call him Mr. McGee on Facebook or something. And people would say, what are you doing? How dare you be so rude? And I went like, I know Alan, he knows my sense of humor, you know, and it got a like from him and like, it, same with Jen, you know, Jen knows what I'm like, you know, every, everybody knows that, you know, I'm, I'm just a wee cheeky pixie. You, you play rough. <laughs> My cheeky pixie. Yeah, cheeky pixie, yes, <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. I don't play rough at all, I'm just a wee bit naughty. Yeah, exactly, but with a good heart and all in good yeah. fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I this... don't wish, don't wish any ill on anyone. Not a single soul, even if somebody is really horrible to me, you know, I'm not going to be horrible to them. I might bite back for a bit if I'm, you know, spontaneous reaction, but In I, never, I never bear grudges. It's, it's just a waste of your time because if you're feeling bad about somebody, they haven't a clue. They don't know you're feeling, you're having horrible thoughts about them. So all you're doing mm -hmm. is tainting your own soul. Exactly. And as we alluded to earlier, often those people are just sort of projecting their own inner misery on other people anyway. And and it's you they win if you get taken down by that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. It's like life's too short to sort of be seething and sort of having putrid thoughts that would just rot you away. You know, Absolutely. it's like um, there is light out there. <laughs> Yes, there's lots of it. Even actually. in the dark, there's plenty of light. Yes, I keep having to tell myself that a lot these days. But yeah, sometimes you do need to sometimes even say it out loud. Yeah, you know, because it affirms it more if you're in a dark place. Because I do suffer from depression and me too sort of stuff like that. So 
as many people do, yeah. you know, but sometimes you just got to say things out loud so that you hear it from the outside coming in and not just from the out inside going out. Absolutely. Or sing it or play it. Absolutely. I say that all the time. I say, you know, if I could just sing to people instead of talk to them, I wouldn't be so socially awkward. <laughs> <laughs> in those situations, I'm kind of like, mm, sometimes sometimes I'm a social butterfly and chat to everybody and sometimes I'm really quiet, sat in the corner. Now, if I could sing everything I was going to say, I could do it easy. You know, it would, life would be so much easier for me if I could sing everything, except for the fact that I'd probably be locked up somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> A, a, a sad reality of our uh, of our society, maybe. I, yeah. I think that would be great myself, but who am I? But it, another weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know. But I always say, I just like say, to people, I'm a freak magnet. Yes. You know, it's like if if I went on a bus, you know, the weirdest person that gets on the bus will come and sit beside me. <laughs> I once said that to some therapist or something I'm just a freak magnet I, I don't do public transport because I have a hard time on public transport <laughs> you know and they just thought I've not heard that expression before I think I'll use that I'm just going to try living it mate <laughs> <laughs> well Rose maybe to bring we, we started, we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, music is kind of... We haven't uh, talked about music much, have we? Yeah, I know. Exactly. So I feel strange bringing music back Well, I have a six-string guitar and I have a 12-string guitar. And <laughs> 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 well, you, you, and you are still doing music to this day, right? The, 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 was the last thing that you put out the, the Far From the Apple Tree soundtrack? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Which that was, was the last thing. And I'm working on some new stuff now. Fantastic. Uh, is there any sort of a, like a, a website or some place that people can go to l listen and or buy? You know, buy? I don't have a website. I really need, I really need to get one set up. But my, my ex, when I had one, when I, when Sorrow, when we split up, he took the whole website down, and, and I'm not technically minded, but I guess there's tutorials where you can do it quite easily yourself, apparently now. So I better do that, but. I, I am on Facebook and there's, there was a fan page on there, but I tend to never go on it. And I, I have to be a wee bit more proactive with what I'm doing because <laughs> I tend to be like a real owner unless I'm out there doing a gig. You're not really probably see me, you know. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll put plenty of links in the episode notes uh, so that people can go to wherever it is that your music is and, and buy and or listen to it because it's been some wonderful stuff that has kept me sane, uh, especially through the, era, uh, the decade of the 80s, listening to the music that you made oh, and all the projects. Much. Yeah. Oh, it was really fantastic. I'm so glad that it's come full circle and I've actually had a chance to have a conversation with you. I, I thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Oh, no problem. I the thing is with like interviews, if they're just kind of open and if you're not, if the interview is not strict with the questions, I fly all over the place. You know? That's good. <laughs> Which is why as the conversation may be like completely eclectic. And we haven't touched on music a lot, really, have we? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's just like, oh, I'm locked up so much when I get a chance to talk, I can't stop. No, that's great. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, well, it's been really nice talking yeah. at you. <laughs> oh, no. No, it's been a two-way street. Good. Good. Because yeah. I, 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 I am conscious of the fact that sometimes I'll just ramble on. There's nothing wrong with that. You have great things to say. So you had a rapt audience, and I'm sure the listeners will love it. <laughs> uh, save the best for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we should definitely do it again. Okay. Well, Rose, I will let you get on with your evening. Happy birthday once again, which oh, maybe is you. in, what, four hours now? Something like that? Uh, Somewhere yeah. thereabouts. I was going to say the time, but I don't want some nutty 
the astrologers out there going and doing my bloody chat. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> Don't give them too much information, right? <laughs> exactly. Especially, you know, they're all into magic and all sorts. It's like yes. sort of signing some autograph for some girl and I was like playing recurrent in Switzerland somewhere and I was bleeding. Like when we do um, Christ and the Pale Queen's Might and Sorrow, like when we do that, I always would bleed when I play the guitar on that. And to be <laughs> so I'd be like blood all over my hands and the skittle. Can I have your autograph? I got blood on it. So I took it away and she went and I wrote it again. She went, Oh no, can I have the one with blood on it? And I was just thinking, You just told me you were a witch ten minutes ago <laughs> ten minutes ago. Of course you can't. You know <laughs> I mean I don't leave my hair and hair brushes or anything, you know. Yeah. That's good. That's that's, a, that's the way. Of my DNA. <laughs> exactly. No traces left behind. <laughs> it's been really nice talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for the chat, Rose. And uh, let's do it again sometime in the future. Yeah, and hopefully when this deadly virus goes, I'll be heading over there. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, I was meant to be. I should have been there now, actually, September, October, where I was setting up a tour to go to America. And obviously the virus put a full stop on everything. So Is it postponed? But Yeah, well, yeah. it wasn't finalised yet, so I guess the planning kind of stopped. But, I mean, half of it was already done, but it, I, will, I will do it again. Fantastic. It's like, we just like probably do the two coasts separately. I kind of wanted to do them together, but it's I'm, a lot, it's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in the middle, right smack in the middle of the coast. So I would have to travel. Oh, where so are you? I'm in Kansas and smack dab in the middle of America. Oh, no way. Yeah. In Lawrence where, where uh, William Burroughs spent his last couple of decades. Oh, I was thinking more of the Wizard of Oz story. <laughs> <laughs> that too, that too. That's the, that's the more uh, stereotypical answer. <laughs> As we got me excited. <laughs> yeah. I hear the Yellow Brick Road still exists and it's not far outside New York. Oh, I didn't know that. There's like little bits of it. Apparently it's all grown over, but huh. somebody told me it's still there. And God, I don't let the tourists know for God's sake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They'll be taking chunks of so it away with I them. I definitely want to, It's not far from New York here, so I'm going to see the bits. I'm going to have a piece. <laughs> yes. <laughs> take <laughs> Just a take bit my of, gun and not let them stop me. Yes. <laughs> take a bit, a bit of it back in your luggage. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a good rest. Yeah, that's, that's real magic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Talk about leaving traces behind. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, have a good rest of your evening and your birthday, Rose, and thanks oh, so much cheers, again. thanks. All right. Take care. Right. Anything else you need, just give me a, give me a call. Okay. I will, and then when it, it, the episode is up and uh, live, I will let you know. Brilliant. Thanks very much. All right. See you, Rose. You too. Cheers. <laughs>
Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Uh, I never in a million years in the mid-80s when I was listening to my favorite current 93 album, Earth Covers Earth, or listening to Coil, or listening to Psychic TV when I was immersed in that world of sort of heady, esoteric music that took music to a different level uh, where you were delving a little deeper into the psyche and into the occult and into magic and into a world that musically occupied a place completely different than the music that I grew up uh, listening to occupied, which was music to tap your foot to, to forget about your life, to, to escape. It was escapism. And this music was much more internal and timeless. And I never would have guessed that I would be talking to one of the people responsible for bringing that music to me and really changing my life in a lot of ways. So it was a pleasure. I'm so glad that Rose agreed to do it. And hopefully it was enjoyable to all of you. Um, Probably maybe more enjoyable to those who also had uh, similar experiences um, to me have some experience in listening to the music that she made. But hopefully, you know, it it piqued the interest of some of you who was not familiar with that music, which is one of the reasons I wanted to include some songs and some pieces that she had a part of and that she composed um, to give a, a taste and also to underlie the mood of... Uh, the musical context of the things that she was talking about. So it was brilliant. I loved it. And I will have her back and we'll go into more uh, musical uh, territory. Um, This one was more biographical. Um, And, you know, there's a blurry line between the two, of course. But anyway, I loved it. Hopefully you enjoyed it too. If you like The Melt, if you like this episode, if you liked other episodes that you've listened to uh, and would like to contribute, I wholeheartedly encourage you to do so. And there's many ways to do that. The most tangible way would be financially. And you can do that by going to www.patreon.com slash The Melt Podcast. And you can find ways there to financially contribute from anywhere from a dollar up. Whatever you think this is worth to you, Um, any little bit helps. And I would like to thank the Patreon members who have uh, kind of hopped aboard recently. I greatly appreciate you doing that. Uh, It means a lot to me and helps to keep the wheels turning and keep the melt expanding and getting better. We also have a Discord page. Uh, This is not a way to contribute, but it's a way to contribute to the community that I would like to build uh, around this. More on that later. Uh, I just opened it up. There's a link on the web page, but if you visit there, you will quickly realize that I've done nothing there yet. I'm still learning about it, but at least I have the, the place marker. Other ways that you can contribute would be going to wherever it is that you you get this podcast and subscribe to it or leave a good rating or a wonderful uh, review. All those things help. Other ways would be sharing it, sharing it on your social media, data harvesting uh, arena of choice, or by word of mouth, email it to a friend, a family member, whoever you think would be into this stuff and might benefit from it. I'm always open to input. If you have input or stories of your own experiences uh, with the kind of stuff that we talk about here, uh, you can send all of that to themeltpodcast at protonmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening. You are greatly appreciated, and I hope that you were able to glean something positive from this. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I think Rose enjoyed herself too. And uh, yeah, it was it was great. Uh, I, I look forward to doing it again. Have a lot of great stuff coming up throughout the rest of this year and into the beginning of next year. So keep your eyes peeled. The goodness just keeps flowing. Thank you all so much. And until next time, two weeks from now, take care. Mm-hmm.